Um, I'm Robert Lair. This is my wife, Carol. And uh, we want to really thank you all for coming. Um, we're the authors of the Naples Beach Homes book, Cottages, Castles, and the Families that Built Them. And I know we've all been through this uh, Hurricane Irma um, the last month or so of our lives, and it's all affected us um, some more, some less. And we're hoping that um, today we can sort of put that aside and uh, you'll get uh, some education and hopefully a lot of fun and, and entertainment. We, we try to do that. Um, we have actually um, been speaking now, um, have been invited to speak. This is our third year, and um, which we're very gratified and uh, to be able to do this. We never thought we would have a book that uh, is now in its third printing. Um, just a few other things I wanted to tell you because we're glad about it. Um, when we started, um, talking to the homeowners who are people who live right on the beach in Naples. So you know they're, they're people of substantial means. And um, part of our plan was we didn't think they would talk to us. We didn't know if they'd talk to us at all. But we didn't think they'd talk to us if we were going to make money off of them. So our initial plan was we were going to donate all of the proceeds from our book, which could have been zero as far as we know, um, to a nonprofit, and that became the Naples Historical Society. And as of today, um, we have just hit the $70,000 mark in donations to the society. Um, all of the all of the profits go to the society, as as I've indicated. So um, here we are today. And um, we're going to be talking about beach homes. And it took us about three years to put the book together. But this book didn't start three years ago. This all started about 32 years ago in a courthouse in Denver, Colorado. Not Bailey, Denver. And um, I was the attorney in that uh, court courtroom, number one, in Denver. And I was not the defendant. I was there to try a jury trial. And the judge brought out the jurors. And who in the world do you think was juror number one? So I always tell people, go to jury duty. Don't try to get out of it, because Prince Charming might be waiting for you there. Not always Prince Charming, but that's beyond the scope of this. And you know when we got married? We got married in that courtroom where we met. <laughs> so I always like to start by, um, by asking, how many of you have ever taken that drive south from, from uh, Gulf Shore Boulevard, and then it turns into Gordon Drive? Do all of you, uh, for those of you that didn't raise your hands, um, do you know what uh, those streets are? Those are the streets that are, have the residences in Naples right on the beach. And um, for those of you that have taken that drive, how many of you have ever wondered who in the world gets to live in those homes? Some of them just, some of them cottages, but a lot of them castles now. And um, who, gets to who gets to look out their uh, kitchen window and see the, the Gulf of Mexico and have sand? Um, well, you know what? That's what we wondered also. And we started to run this idea of, how could we talk to those families? We would run it by our family, our friends, and uniformly, we got the same answer. Those families will never talk to you. Well, after about six months of hearing this will never happen, we were at a little gathering, and one of our friends came up to us who had heard of our crazy idea and said, 
See that man over there? You ought to go talk to him about your idea. He knows a little bit about the beach. So we, um, we went over, didn't know who he was. We had met him once before. And um, we started talking to him about this idea of finding out about the beach homes and getting a lot of the beach history. And after about five minutes, he stopped us and he said, you know what? My family has owned a home on the beach for the last 64 years. Why don't you start with us? <laughs> we couldn't believe it. We got our camera out and we got our recorder out and we visited him and he actually drove us up and down the beach and started tremendous oral history with us. Three years later, we had talked to over 40 families who had lived on the beach either in the past or live there now. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Now, a little historical perspective. Naples was platted in about the 18, the mid 1800s, 18, the mid 1880s. And when they platted it, they did something interesting that we still have today. From the Gordon River on the south, all the way to the beach club on the north, which is about four and a half miles on the beach, it's all single family residential. When you get to the beach club, if you ever drive it, you'll notice that that's where the zoning changed and you get mid-rise. That was in the 1960s and 70s and then as you get farther north the par uh, into Park Shore, that's when high rises went in. So you have an interesting situation in Naples where if you want to live on the beach in Naples proper, there's only 130 single family lots. Now sometimes they double up, it can go to 130 to 140, they'll put two lots together, take them apart. So that's why people from all over the United States and all over the world want to be on that beach because there's just a few spots in Naples where you can be there. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, with that said, let me turn it over to Carol. I also want to extend my thanks to Joy and the Collier County Museum because it's our favorite type of audience to speak to people who we already know are interested in history and who love to hear the tales of the early days of Naples and Collier County. Robert indicated that our project grew little by little with one beach home family introducing us to another. And as the project uh, began to he also offered to create an original painting to open each chapter in the book. So on that day, the book became not only a history of Naples and the stories of the Beach families, it became a beautiful art book as well. So we told um, Paul, it's titled Naples Beach Homes, Cottages, Castles, and the Families that Built Them, so we definitely know we needed a cottage. And Paul put that beach cottage right there on the right. That is a cottage that still stands there today. It's been there since about 1912, just to the north of the pier. And then we needed a castle. So Paul used his artist's license and he moved this lovely mansion up the beach and put it in the cover painting. And then we needed something unique to Naples, Florida. We didn't want people to say, well, maybe this is a book about Nantucket or Charleston, or we wanted something special to Naples, and that's our wonderful Naples Pier. He even put his kitty cat in the painting, 
See that little cat there? That's Atticus Arsenault. And you can sometimes see Atticus sitting on the sidewalk as you walk down to the, to the pier. Now in the next slide, I'll have to ask you if anyone can guess what is this lovely country lane? Anybody? That is Gordon Drive in the 1920s. And some of the old timers, okay, some of the old timers remember uh, Florida Panthers crossing that little sandy lane. But now in the next photo, you'll see the Gordon Drive that we all know today. <laughs> and as Robert said, here is the Gordon uh, Pass coming down from Naples Bay out into the Gulf. And you can see Gordon Drive, the southernmost part of Gordon Drive there. And then you head north along Gordon Drive and Gulf Shore Drive, way up to the Beach Club Hotel. So as first time authors, we had to decide, well, how should we organize our book? Um, what makes sense for the orders of the chapters? And we realized that if you had a book of your own and a friend in the passenger seat, you could take the book, start at the southern end of Gordon Drive, and then slowly drive north, house to house. And that's how we put the chapters together so that you can make that drive and follow along as you head north. Rob? The, uh, the next three slides are uh, typical of how we put a chapter together. After we do an interview of a present homeowner, what we did was we went back in time and we tried to document the homes that were there prior to the home that's there now, and then going all the way back to the original home. So after we did the interview of uh, the home uh, that uh, we'll show you later on this property, um, we went back in time to 1939 and found the original home on the beach. And as, as, we, uh, as the slide shows, this was a cistern on the roof Naples didn't have a good water system until after World War II. So a lot of people had cisterns on the roof to collect drinking water. Um, as, as we'll also uh, be talking about a little later, there were a lot of brewing, beer brewing families that talked to each other, came from St. Louis or Milwaukee, and came to Naples, and they're still here today. And um, just after World War II, one of those families, the in-law of the Schlitz Brewing Company, Mr. Eli, check, 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 check. built for Naples his first state-of-the-art water purification system. And um, he knew, obviously, a little bit about water, and that's why he was able to do that. So this house... Upside down? Whoops, there we go. Um, well, this house lasted until the 1980s. And, and oh, one more thing about this house, it was owned by a doctor, and if you happen to be his patient, guess where his uh, office was? Right on the beach uh, next, uh, as part of his house. Well, this house came down, and 1987, a totally contemporary house went up. And um, uh, you may have seen this statue. It was at, um, at the Nap what was then the Naples Phil Philharmonic. It's now Artist Naples. Uh, I believe this statue was there for some time. Well, at any rate, um, from 1987, this house lasted until it came down. And you can imagine what, what went up next. So from a cottage to a castle. And by the way, um, uh, two of the people we were talking to indicated that they're just visiting Naples. And I don't know if you're in the market or anyone's in the market for a house. This house has been for sale for, is it three years now? And it can, you can, it can be had for the price of $65 million. Is it a family? 
Say again. Uh, in this castle, the family lives the whole year here, or is it also only for vacation? The, the gentleman is asking, um, uh, generally, do the families uh, live in these houses all year long? Generally, uh, the answer is no. Uh, a lot of these families have houses up north as well. And, but one of the reasons that uh, they do live down here, as you all may know, um, Naples, Florida does not have an income tax. So a lot of the, the folks um, that live in the beach homes and a lot of other people are down here for six months and a day so that they don't have to pay a state income tax. A number of the chapters in the book are historical in nature. And uh, this handsome gentleman is Walter Haldeman. I think of him as the George Washington of Naples because he was the founder of our wonderful little town. He was a gentleman of letters. He was the editor and publisher of the Louisville, Kentucky Courier Journal. And for some reason that I haven't yet discovered, he and some colleagues wanted to sail down the coast of Florida in the mid 1880s and find the perfect spot to build a lovely little resort town. And they selected Naples. And we're all very glad that they did. Walter's first cottage was several blocks south of the pier and uh, you can see it was built in that low Victorian architecture, a little bit of gingerbread, little porches. But he and his wife Elizabeth only spent one winter season in this cottage, and Walter wanted to get closer to where the action was. He was building the pier, he was building the original hotel, he had created a post office, and he had a little steamer, a little ship that left Punta Gorda three days a week to bring passengers and supplies to the pier in Naples. Because remember, in this era, Punta Gorda was the closest that you could get to Naples by car or by railroad. So from Punta Gorda South, you all came on the little steamer called the Fearless. And people remember it as like living on an island because it was only accessible by boat. Well, Mr. Haldeman and Elizabeth built a much grander home just by the pier. And it was this amazing estate called Sea Villa. It took up a whole city block had the main house, a guest house on the grounds, a little bath house out on the sand. And it also had a wonderful stable because it was horse carts and horses that first carried people around Naples. Then when the horseless carriage arrived, it became a garage. And then finally, by the late 40s, it had been made into a beautiful uh, guest cottage. And many people remember it. You'll see it in the next sign scene, the beloved painted cottage. And it was to this home that Mary Watkins came as a young bride. Mary is the matriarch of the Beach Club Hotel family. And in around 1947 or 48, she married Henry Watkins Jr. And they came down as a young couple to help his father run the Beach Club Hotel and golf course. And this was the cottage they lived in uh, before they built their own home nearby. Rob? Now, let me uh, give you a perspective of where we are now. Um, we're at, the, the pier is 1200 South. Right here, we're at 1400 South. Um, this is the home of Mary Watkins. She built it with her new husband in 1952. And when you walk into this home, you walk right into 1952. 
Nothing has changed. I'll never forget when she took us into her kitchen. She had one of these, uh, she was showing us uh, her shelves and the little things in her kitchen. And she pulled out on a hinge one of these uh, little um, round shelves as, and on it was a uh, turquoise mixer right from 1952. Well, um, behind her home is the beach and her view of the pier. And in front of it to the right is a third of a block of property. And um, this is the only structure on the property the entire third of a block is basically Mary Watkins Botanical Garden. Um, and when we were interviewing Mary, and she said it was okay to tell people we talked to, she's in her 90s now, but we noticed that just off the beach on her property were two all-terrain vehicles. And I said, Mary, Tell me about those all-terrain vehicles. I know you're not driving them around. And um, she said, well, you know, every year for many years going back, uh, during turtle nesting season, I let the Conservancy of Southwest Florida park their all-terrain vehicles here so that they can go out every morning and find where the eggs are and put the yellow tape around them so that people don't walk on them. Now we often get the question, well, how does the conservancy find those eggs when they've been totally buried? Well, the answer is, have you all done um, it, it in the snow? Have you all done the snow angels? Well, imagine the turtles using their flippers to come on to the land, they bury their eggs and then they make a path back down to the Gulf so you have a path. And that's what the Conservancy looks for before people come on the beach because if you didn't see it, you'd walk right on them and you could hurt them. So they, um, they mark off the, uh, the, uh, the, the nests and they're protected for until hopefully the uh, little little turtles uh, come out in uh, in August September. Well, I did say to Mary, uh, Mary, that's pretty nice that you let let the conservancy just use your property every year. And I'll never forget she said to me, um, you know what? It's the least I can do for the sea turtles. Now. Do you remember that painted cottage that, that used to be a stable? This stands where that is today at 1300 South, looking right out to the pier at 1200 South. And uh, this was part of the Haldeman property, uh, his second house that we showed you, because he wanted to be, he found out he wanted to be right near the pier. Um, so this home is there today. When the uh, painted cottage came down, this went up. This is the home of uh, Lisbeth Beckton. And um, I'll never forget when we, uh, as we uh, often did to fact check, we would um, interview the beach homeowners, and then we would uh, write our narrative. We would go back and meet the families and fact check. Um, and by, by the way, we never... Um, we never got a bad edit. No one ever said, don't say that. Uh, our job wasn't to zap anybody. It was to get good family history and Naples history. But at any rate, um, when we took the narrative back to Elizabeth Beckton, she said something interesting. She said, I like what you've written, but could you write something more about my father? Because I wouldn't be living on the beach without him. Now, we knew exactly what her father did, but she hadn't talked about that in her interview. And um, so she told us about her father. And what her father did about 55 years ago, he was in the medical industry, and he invented disposable syringes for things like diabetes, where they used to have to clean the syringes and there was infection. He changed the entire industry. And today, um, 
her, her family company is called Becton Dickinson. And um, uh, they're in, uh, they have some 80,000 employees in 50 countries. And um, uh, they're, they're still going strong. We're going to do a little bit of history here um, and talk about a family that came down in the 1940s and 50s, and that was Glenn and Helen Sample from Chicago. And um, the Samples are the people that developed Port Royal, which is the, the area um, in, in South Naples um, that, that, that has all the, the beautiful houses in it. And, um, the Samples have an, an interesting history from Chicago. Where did they make their money that they could come down and buy up land? By the way, the land they bought up was swamp land. And they're the ones that dug the channels out so people w could bring their boats in, into Port Royal. But at any rate, Mr. Sample was in the advertising business in Chicago. And he represented um, a lot of detergent soap companies like Oxidol. Remember Oxidol? Well, he was, reading, um, he was reading a magazine one week in Chicago, and he, he was reading a serial story. One week you'd have the first part of it, and then the second week, the, and, and so on and so forth. And he had an idea that made him a lot of money. He brought that idea to the radio, serials. And the reason they're called soap operas is because he represented Oxidol, and that was one of the big advertisers. Well, Glenn came down, and Glenn and Helen beat the, uh, built this house right on the beach in 1952. And... Um, to the left of this slide, they also had a guest house. When this house came down, first the guest house came down, and this house went up, and it went from the Sample family to the Swanson family. This, this is the home that's there today where the guest house was. And uh, you would know the Swanson name, Swanson Frozen Foods. How do you handle a hungry man? Remember that commercial? Well, that was Clark and Elizabeth Swanson. Um, Elizabeth is a very um, esoteric, eclectic lady, and um, only she would um, uh, have her house painted uh, pink and uh, uh, with blue shutters. Uh, she told us a story that um, she ordered a pizza one day, and um, Yes, these folks order, they like pizza just like all the rest of us. But the, the pizza delivery boy came up and he said, Ma'am, do you know that everybody says that uh, you live in what looks like a birthday cake? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a look at the inside of the Swanson House. You can, uh, you can uh, let these slides sort of speak for themselves. Uh, this room you can barely walk through. But um, you'll notice on the uh, right-hand wall, uh, those, are, those are original Audubons. This is that same house from the beach. And, you know, the, all of Naples beaches are open to the public, to what's called mean high tide, which is where generally the high tide uh, comes up up to that point, you can walk up and down the beach all you want to. And of course, people walk closer to the houses as well. Um, but you, if you want to walk on the beach and see these houses, a lot of times the view from the beach is a lot better than from Gordon Drive and because um, the homeowners don't want to ruin their view out to the Gulf. You remember the uh, Sample House, 1952? Not the guest house. Well, the original house came down as well, and this house went up about five years ago, and uh, its cost was uh, $75 million. This is from a chapter called The Girl Next Door. Um, 
in the lower house, in the lower part of the slide, that was, um, that was owned by the uh, Klumsky family from uh, Chicago. And they had a son who was a student at the University of, of Miami. And that, their son was Dale. And Dale came home uh, to visit his dad one vacation, to visit his mom and dad. And um, his dad grabbed him by the arm and said, Dale, I know I'm going to get in trouble, but you got to check out the girl who just moved in next door. I don't know if you've ever done that, but with my son, I've done it, and I get in a lot of trouble. But uh, anyway, Dale decided to go check it out. He rolled his eyes, and he went over to the, to the driveway, and he saw this girl there, and he came back very quickly and said, Dad, please, um, I don't know what you saw in this girl, but she's not for me. Now, Dad was having none of that. He said, Dale, I may be old, but I'm not blind. As, da as uh, Dale tells it. And um, he said, let's go out. And he took Dale out to the beach side and pointed out another young lady. And this chapter ends by saying, Dale and Kathleen have now been happily married for over 50 years. <laughs> now, before we go on to the next slide, I'd just like to point out this little white roofed ranch style house. Remember, as Robert opened, he told you there was one family that had owned a home on Naples Beach for 64 years. That's the home. That original one-story house was the home that was the first to uh, become the basis of our Beach Homes book. Now that home and the little one next door to it are both gone. They've both been demolished. And this large, empty lot is uh, standing there where the two homes used to be for so many years. That's also on the market <laughs> if you're looking to build a house. This home down here in the left-hand corner was the former home of the Steyer family, Shelley and Ralph Steyer, and they are the Johnsonville Sausage family. That uh, is, was their home on the beach. Some of our owners really wanted to share with us the architecture, the landscaping, the story of the house itself. And that was true of this couple from Kansas City. They owned an original one-story beach house right on this lot for many years, but they had traveled in Southeast Asia, and they always dreamed of taking the original home down and building a beautiful Asian-inspired residence. And as they traveled, they kept running into the architecture of a man named Jeffrey Bawa, B-A-W-A. -A. He is a Sri Lankan and is known in uh, Asia as the Frank Lloyd Wright of Southeast Asia. So they came back to Naples, found a couple of wonderful architects here who were happy to create the home that they envisioned. And uh, so they built their wonderful home, we call it Inside outside in, inside out. Here's their living room with many of the treasures that they brought back from their travels uh, in Southeast Asia. And in the next slide, you'll see their pretty terrace, their lanai looking out to the Gulf. Robert took this photo standing on top of a very tall ladder. And I always encouraged him to just go one rung higher. Never high enough. Never high enough. <laughs> a number of the houses are beautiful when viewed from the air. And this is our Sri Lankan inspired home. As the book went on, quite a few local photographers would call and say, I'd like to contribute to your project. Do you have a photo of the Naples Pier? Do you have a photo of the fireworks on the 4th of July? And one day Robert got a call from an aerial photographer. And he said, I'd be happy to donate all the aerial photos of the beach homes if you could hire a helicopter. So we said, well, <laughs> how many people can fit in one of those helicopters? And he said two or four. So 
We chose the four-person helicopter, and on the day that this flight went up to take the photos, Robert and I were there uh, to uh, guide them to the houses along the beach. Rob? This is the, uh, the home of uh, Lou and Don Allen, A-L-L-Y-N. And I'd like to tell you about the Allen family, uh, talking about an, an experience we've all had. You know, um, when you have your doctor's appointment at, say, 9 in the morning, and you think, oh, boy, I'm going to be first in, and about 9.35, they, you think you're making progress. They bring you into that little room, and you wait another 20 minutes. Have you all done that? Well, next time you're in that little room, you know, the one that's got the scale and the blood pressure machine, just take a look around, and on a lot of those medical machines, you'll see the name Welsh Allen. And that is the, um, that's the, the Allen family. They're, they are... Uh, fifth generation, believe it or not, in Naples today. Now, the Allens own this home on the beach, and they also own the lots, which they have not changed. They're still in the natural condition, both to the north and south of them. So they've got uh, a lot of beachfront. This is their uh, view out to the Gulf. And this is a shot of um, one of their side yards, just in its natural condition. And we had something interesting happen to us. Uh, we had already put this chapter to bed. We had met with the Allens, gone over the narrative. Um, this is one where uh, Mr. Allen uh, added more to the stories he had told us in his interview, and we added that. So... Um, we got home, put the chapter to bed. We were thinking, boy, we're, we're going to, this may actually be a book someday. We're, we're, we've got quite a few homes going. And one morning, we got a call from Don Allen. And Don said, Robert Carroll, could you bring those photographs back over to our house? And if possible, could you do it tomorrow morning? And I thought, oh boy, what have we done? So we got the photographs, marched up the front stairs, and Dawn was there with a big smile on her face. And she said, I'm so glad you're here. We have family in town, and we don't have any good photos to show them. And I sort of went, whoa, that's, that's good. So um, this was one of the photos that was not going to be in the book. We had already um, uh, put the chapter together. And Dawn asked us, she said, you know, I love this photo. Is there any way you could put it in the book? And, you know, you don't, these people have invited us in their homes. They've been courteous, wonderful. You don't say, no way, we'll decide. We were happy to do it. And um, I said, why is this so important to you? And she said, well, every year for the last 20 years, we have our family and our kids and grandkids over for our Easter egg hunt. <laughs> Now, not all of the homes on the beach are castles. There's about 22 original homes still on the beach, about 22. Um, this is one of them. Well, this, was this the original, honey, or not? This I, is the original yeah. house. Um, when we came up to this house, as you can see, there are murals on the outside, and there are also murals on the inside. We sat down um, with Paul von Gontard, who was 85 years old. You may not know the name, but you'll know his company. And um, we sat down in a room, and right across from us was, this was part of one of the inside murals. And you could see it's a, it's a little white table, and he was married to, Paul was married to Mickey, and on the table, on the left, is a can of Budweiser. And I said, Paul, um, can you tell us about this? And he said, and this is just how he talked. He said, well, you see that can of Budweiser? That's my family. You see that can of Falstaff? 
I married that family. <laughs> Wonderful guy. Now, one of the things that started to happen to us as we did one family after another, and, and um, you know, they, they all, a lot of these families know each other, they talk to each other, they go to the Port Royal Club, and the word got out that the lairs are not dangerous. They are actually doing something legitimate. <laughs> and um, families, all of a sudden, when we came to the interview, they would bring out a big box of old photos or old memorabilia. And um, this is one of those photos, which is very apropos for today. On September 10th, just like Hurricane Irma, but September 10th, 1960, Hurricane Donna hit Naples. This was taken on September 11th at the Von Gontard house. And you'll see the door has blown in. And you see that tree in the background? That tree is not on the inside of the house. That tree is on the outside of the house. And the reason you can see it is because all of the lower walls of the house have been washed away. And yet at the same time, take a look at that corner cabinet there's still pottery on that corner cabinet. So you never know when there's gonna be a, what's called a microburst in a hurricane and really blows something out, and when something's not gonna get hurt at all or is somehow protected. Thank you. It's the first time I've ever felt like Vanna White. <laughs> Some of the houses along the beach are done in this kind of architecture. It's a modern sort of abstract style. There are just a few of them, uh, of this uh, architecture. But this is a very good example of one. And this is the home of Ronald and Michelle Brown. This is taken from the beach side, Robert standing on the top of their seawall on a very tall ladder. <laughs> So we're looking across their back lawn up to their swimming pool and their lanai. This wall over to the left is a water feature. And on those little ledges, water drops down from ledge to ledge and into a pretty pool below. But every once in a while, they have to shut the water feature off and find new homes for all the frogs <laughs> that have taken up residence in the, in the wall. Over on the front entrance on the Gordon Drive side, this is the staircase leading up to their front door. And you can see they've installed this beautiful sculpture. It's a series of panels of hot poured glass. And in each panel, there is a totem which represents one of the indigenous peoples who live along the shores of the seas and oceans of planet Earth. Michelle Brown told us um, that she got her interior decoration palette from the sea. So we called the chapter a palette from the sea. She said, I was having trouble getting my interior designer to understand the colors I was hoping for. So I grabbed him by the arm and we went right down to the beach. And I scooped up a handful of sand and said, I'd like that for my neutral color. And it was the time of year that the little coquinas are all there, the little tiny clams with their beautiful colors. And so she got her color on the paintings on the wall and then she pointed out over the gulf to the beautiful blue of the gulf for her accent color. So she did get her palette from the sea. Michelle is also an expert on beautiful things made of wood. And she told us that this is her favorite room in the house. This is her study. It's modeled after the gentleman's smoking room on the old French liner, the SS Normandy. She said, do you see those two little end tables? They once were in the gentleman's smoking room on the SS Normandy. Now we're up the beach a little farther to another historical chapter, 
We title it The Friends That Made Milwaukee Famous. As so many of us did, the Briggs family of Briggs and Stratton engines, they learned about uh, Naples from friends of theirs who said, you know, we found this great little town way down on the west coast of Florida. You better come down and see if you'd like it too. Well, Beatrice and Stephen Briggs came down, fell in love with Naples, and bought 400 feet along Naples Beach and built this gorgeous home in 1936. They called it Solana, Place of the Sun. And here's Solana from the beach side. You can see in the early days, they had huge wooden seawalls. But with every tropical storm or every passing hurricane, the old wooden seawalls would wash away. And so they finally went to the concrete style that we know today. The next slide will show you the living room of Solana uh, sometime in the early 60s. Their grandson, Stephen Briggs, brought one of those big boxes of family memorabilia to us. And this photo was there in that collection. And you can see the old shag carpeting. Remember the kidney-shaped coffee tables? And the magazines are Life, Holiday, Harper's Bazaar, and Vogue. Beatrice lived a wonderful life, whether she was here in Milwaukee or up in, uh, or down here in Naples or up in Milwaukee. And she was the founder of our Naples Community Hospital. She did all the original fundraising for that. She used to have white elephant sales, she called them, rummage sales out on the big front lawn. And if you'll notice, the hospital has its resale shop up by Home Depot there, and it's called the White Elephant Center in honor of Beatrice and the early rummage sales that she had. Now try to imagine Naples in the 30s, 40s, even into the 50s. There were no beautiful restaurants, no nice cocktail lounges, no beautiful communities with lovely clubhouses. So if you wanted a tavern, you built one in your home. And this was the tavern room at the Briggs household. <laughs> you can see they must have traveled in Central America, Mexico. We even found in the box of family memories, Mr. Briggs' favorite cocktail recipe, the rum dum, to be served promptly at noon on Sundays. <laughs> Rob? Oops. Um, I, I wanted to make one, one comment as I'm looking at these slides. Because we're using a, um, a, a TV screen, a lot of the colors are washed out, which reminded me of a, a, a story that happened to us when we were doing the book. As we got along doing the book, the, as, as Carol mentioned, the word got out, there's going to be a book talking about all these beach homeowners that nobody knows anything about. And, um, and our editor came to us and she said, listen, I think you've got something here. I want to take all your photography up to a company called Quad Graphics in Boston. They do all the National Geographic photography. And... and um, when you uh, look at the uh, color in the book, it is uh, it's state of the art. It's uh, we were we were amazed at uh, it does it it doesn't look like this. It is sharp, but at any rate, um, this is the home of Peter and Stella Thomas. Uh, this obviously is um, Paul Arsenault's painting. One of his paintings that he did for the book leads each chapter. And this he did from a photograph of a fundraiser that um, uh, was going on at the Thomas family uh, home. <clears throat> now, you may not know the name Peter Thomas, but you would know his melodic voice. Peter Thomas is the voice of hundreds of commercials and TV programs. Peter Thomas is the man that you've heard say, American Express, don't leave home without it, 
or Peter Paul Almond Joy, indescribably delicious. If any of you watch Forensic Files today, um, if, if, if it comes on, uh, listen to the voice. It, it is a melodic voice. You can see why, um, uh, why he did all of, all of these uh, commercials and, uh, and uh, TV programs. Well, this was their home. And um, this is a view of their home from the beach. It was a very historic home, um, designed after a, uh, a home um, that was built for the, uh, built in, in Barbados. This, um, Stella told us this was the first Palladian window in Naples. This is their view out to the Gulf. And notice this shot. This I took from their front door. Um, they lived on a lot that they almost have a block going out to Gordon Drive. And you'll notice it was just, it was park-like. Now I'm going to take you to the next, um, the next slide, which is this same area, but from the Gulf looking back to the Thomas House. On Gordon Drive, excuse me. And you can see all of the, um, the park-like trees. Most of them have been taken out. And this is the day before the Thomas House was demolished. And um, if you drive by there today, you'll see a home being built. It's being built for the last three years. A lot of people call it the Colossus. Um, it's being built by the uh, founder of Best Buy, Richard Schultz. And um, all I can do is tell you, it's big. And the historic home is gone. Carol? Now, the last home that we're going to share with you this afternoon is this one. It's by far the most elegant and formal house that we visited. So we called this chapter European Grandeur. It's the home of Lynette and Richard Merillat. And they're from the family, the Merillat family, that created the Merillat cabinetry. The idea that you could standardize cabinets, deliver them to a project, rather than have a cabinet maker have to create each set of cabinets from scratch. But this is not the first home that was on this property. The next slide will show you the original built in 1958, typical of the 50s and 60s, almost always one story, low to the ground, and angled, um, oriented towards the southwest, because these were also seasonal snowbird people. They came down in the winter and wanted to face the beautiful winter sunsets in the southwest. This was the home of Morse and Ethelwyn Dial, Mr. Dial was the chairman and CEO of the Union Carbide Company, and they enjoyed this home for many years. The next slide will show you the view toward the southwest from their living room, those fabulous floor-to-ceiling picture windows. But the Merillats were patient. They waited for the property to become available, and when it did, they purchased it took down the old original home and built their amazing European villa. This is the entry drive coming in from Gordon Drive and the brick pavers of that drive are from the Great Chicago Fire. The next slide shows the uh, foyer of the Merillat home and this is a six foot wooden celestial globe. And Lynette asked me, Carol, do you ever do any catalog shopping? So I said, well, yes, I have great luck with my pennies catalogs. She said, this piece came from a catalog also, from the Sotheby's Art Auction catalog. And it once was in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 
The next scene is Paul Arsenault's impression of the Marilats Lanai, their swimming pool, the view out to the Gulf. And we like to contrast it with Robert's photo of that very same spot. You can appreciate the clarity and the realism of a photograph. And then you can also enjoy the softer impressionist image of a Paul Arsenault painting. We close with an image of the green flash. You may have had skeptical friends and colleagues say, oh, we don't believe in the green flash, but there is one happening. And you know, it's just at the perfect moment when the atmosphere is exactly right, that last tiny nanosecond of the sunset where the sun turns to a chartreuse, kind of a neon green. It's not a flash like an old flash bulb of a camera. It's more of a sudden um, transition from uh, orange light to that chartreuse green. So now we can open up to questions. If you have any, you'd like to share stories of your memories of early Naples. Uh, and we also want you to know we have books here for you this afternoon if you'd like to buy one. We always have a special rate when we speak. And here for the Collier County Museum, it's $50 plus $3 tax. And we'll personalize it for you. Uh, we'd be happy since the gift shop is closed right now because of Big Fat Irma. <laughs> We're happy to have the books here for you today. Rob? Once again, uh, thanks so much for having it. You've been a great audience. Thank you. I mean, I'm going to go in back. I'm okay. Any questions or comments? Yes, yeah, sir. One first question to the beach. How's the beach changing over the time from 1920 to 2015 or so? Is it much more smaller now? Or yes, the sand. Yeah, the question is, how has the beach itself been changing over the decades? The sand itself. I know it's gotten narrower from the water up to, you know, the, the, the dune, because when they platted the town back in 1885 or 87, there was actually a Gulf Street so in front of the houses that faced the beach, there was an actual platted street called Gulf Street. But by 1910, uh, some severe storms had come through Naples. Mr. Haldeman's first little cottage, the little Victorian cottage that he built, that was so badly damaged in the 1910 storm that it had to be taken down. And I think by the 1920s, Gulf Street was gone. It had become a part of the beach. So since those years, it's narrowed. But since I've been coming to Naples, I started coming here in March of 1964. It was my senior year of high school when I first saw the beach. To me, it looks very much the same. Would you agree, Rob, that generally in our lifetimes, the beach has stayed about the same? I think my best guess is not big change. Mm -hmm. Although down at the end, you know, the, the water's uh, hitting some of those houses and uh, eating their sea, um, taking out the lower end of their seawater. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. The one great thing about Naples that makes it especially uh, dear is that those early designers of the old original town, at the end of every east-west avenue, they provided for a public beach access.